This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Natural Grower. Launched in 2019, their award-winning liquid fertiliser and plant feed and soil conditioner is made entirely from maize, naturally rich in nitrogen, potash, phosphate and other trace elements that plants and vegetables love. It's approved by the Soil Association, Vegan Society and organic farmers and growers. Their concentrated natural fertiliser can be poured around the base of plants, whilst the plant feed and soil conditioner can be mixed into the soil or compost and used as a mulch on the surface as a long-term, slow-release fertiliser. The fertiliser can be used for all outdoor and indoor plants. And as a special offer for listeners, Natural Grower are offering 15% off all their range. Simply go to naturalgrower.co.uk and enter Roots15 on checkout, all uppercase. So this week, I'm speaking to Danielle Draper, manager of the Cats Protection National Cat Adoption Centre in Surrey. And we're talking about that sometimes contentious issue of cats and gardens. Cats are part of gardeners' lives, particularly if you live in an urban area. Love them or hate them, you can't get away from them. And Danielle's here to talk about learning to live harmoniously alongside the neighbourhood felines. Yes, so the latest statistics that Cats Protection have um, released show that there are 10.2 10.2 million owned cats in the UK. That's one for about every six people. So it's a, a huge number of cats out there and they are very popular for very good reasons. They're great for de-stressing us and there's actually some research to prove that cats are very good for bringing down our stress levels. Um, and um, they make great pets. So I think, yeah, they are probably growing in popularity. Um, but with that comes the issue of um, the demand. I think if people are more and more people are wanting to take on a cat as a pet, then it's driving that force um, for online sales. And that is something as a charity that we are seeing an issue with. Um, and that issue is growing year on year. It's more and more cats and kittens in particular being sold online. Um, and there's a big problem there because people don't know where they're getting that kitten from, what kind of life it's had, whether it's been well cared for, um, whether mum is being bred and bred and bred without any health consideration to her. Um, So we would always recommend if anyone's looking to um, take on a a cat or a kitten as their new pet um, is to do your research, make sure that you know where you're getting that cat from. And if you do choose to adopt, which obviously we would recommend, we've got many branches and adoption centres throughout the whole of the UK, all with cats looking for new homes and kittens. So um, there's always a cat out there that um, is looking for a new home with somebody. Yes, that's a very, very good advice in my book. So obviously we are talking about gardens and gardening and cats. And there was a survey done by the Mammal Society uh, and they have published the statistic that cats are responsible for the deaths of 100 million prey. And I say, I say put this in inverted quotes, um, prey items every year. Um, so I am assuming that could be anything from flies to moths to birds to bats to, you know, to anything. Um, so have you as a charity kind of looked into those figures? Have you done any research into that? And do you agree with those figures? Well, we haven't done our own research into, into those figures, but we do have, um, good research from very well known organizations such as the RSPB that has shown that cats are not necessarily the primary cause of the declining numbers of birds in particular. Um, So we do recognise that cats are naturally predatory animals. You know, they do need to hunt. That's just something that's natural to them. And um, But there's so many other factors that we should be considering for bird and small mammal species loss, such as mismanagement and loss of traditional wildlife habitat. You know, there's so many new buildings going up and so many green spaces that are declining rapidly that um you know those those animals that have lived there for years and years um that are losing that that space around them 
climate change, obviously, increased use of pesticides and fertilizers in farming. So there's an awful lot of other things that need to be considered um, around that, that declining number. Um, and cats are not the primary cause of that. There's so many other factors that need to be considered. Um, but, do you know, cats do tend to kill the weak and the sickly birds. So it's not even clear whether cat predation replaces other forms of death or is in addition to what would have been a natural death anyway, if that makes sense. So, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot to consider there. But, I yeah, I don't think that there's enough research to show that cats are, are the main source of that those figures so yes no that's a really good point actually about the the fact that that actually they may be taking on a role of a larger predator that has been lost um so yeah that's that's really interesting um so actually i suppose you've kind of you've answered uh, the question that i was going to ask you next really which was you know in view of all the problems that wildlife have um you know cats in the bigger picture then by the sounds of it probably don't don't count account for you know much of the loss no especially like i say if, if they are naturally killing the, the weak um and the sick um in particular birds or small mammals then then no i don't think that they do sit in that bigger picture i think there is there's a bigger picture there if you know what i mean that um that are the the driving forces behind those declining numbers so mm, i suppose it's sometimes it's they're, they're a scapegoat really um yeah yeah okay so well thinking about our gardens so on a slightly smaller scale but also where you know cats and wildlife will rub up against each other um i know not all gardeners like cats and uh i am not one of those because i love cats um so if you really really are a gardener and you really don't like cats and you don't want to have them in your garden um is it is it sensible to think that you could deter them altogether it, I mean, there are certain things that you could do to deter cats from your gardens, but cats are very agile. They're very good climbers. They're very good at negotiating fences. Um, and, you know, they are part of our life and they like being outside, generally speaking. So um, it's quite natural for them to, to have a little wander around. So, I mean, you could put up uh, high fencing there are certain fencing now that they that you can buy that don't allow cats into the gardens um there are other things that you can do to deter cats i mean some of them are quite far out there or whether they work or not is not really for me to say i don't know if there's been enough to say that they do but i know that there are people put um statues of cats in their gardens just so that another cat thinks that there's a cat in their <laughs> garden but I did speak to somebody that did that and the cat that used to visit just started rubbing against the chair and quite liked it so I think he was trying to make friends <laughs> but, um yeah if somebody really doesn't want a cat in their garden I mean you can certainly you know kindly shoo the cat away um you can. I mean, we wouldn't recommend people uh, squirt cats with water, but, you know, if it's just a little, sometimes people get these um, infrared detector um, garden sprays that just come on when they detect movement, which isn't going to drench the cat. It's not going to cause it any harm, but it might be enough for the cat to think, Do you know what, that wasn't much fun. I don't think I'll go back there. But that all said, it's all about territory and that is what cats need. That's naturally what cats need. They need territory space um, and walking along that back end of someone's garden might just be the edge of their territory space where they need to walk along to get to where they need to go. Um, so cats have to work out their territory, especially in built up areas where there's maybe a number of cats living in the same um, area. Um, then they need to work that out. And sometimes that's where you get fights and conflicts happening between cats because they're trying to fight out a particular garden that they both need to try and get to that next part. But um, I've seen some, I've been in some training, which is fascinating when they actually mapped out this whole road and where the cats go and how they cross over to avoid another cat's territory. And it was like one cat would have the whole of garden A and then come into garden B, but just skirt around the edge and up past the tree and then over the fence. And then the rest of garden B belong to another cat. So um, it is all about territory. Um, and, you know, that's 
sometimes is where the problems arise because that cat really does need to come across there because it hasn't got another option to get back to where it needs to go or where it where its territory space is mapped out. Um, and by us trying to deter them from doing that, we might be pushing them into another cat's territory. Um, and then that's when you get sort of conflict happening. That's fascinating. Who knew? Um so what you don't want is your garden to be like in the cat equivalent of spaghetti junction or something. So if you don't want cats in there. <laughs> um, so th- uh, there is a myth, and I know it's a myth because my cats always poo in my garden. Uh, the myth is that cats don't use their own gardens as toilets. Um, so, it, it, you know, obviously that is an issue for people. If they don't have cats and other people's cats are coming in and using their garden as a loo, you know, is there anything they can do to discourage that uh, or, again, to kind of deter the cats from doing it? Or is it just part and parcel of having cats in your neighbourhood? Well, first, you cats need to go to the toilet, um, obviously, and um, they need to do that somewhere, be that in a litter tray in their home or outside, um, you know, in their garden or someone else's garden. But again, it, it's quite often around territory as well. So when it's in someone else's garden, it could be, in particular urinating, it could be that they are mapping out and um, sent marking their territory um, boundary. So it, it tells the other cats that this this area has been taken. This is mine and this is my, my patch. Um, so they will often toilet around the boundaries of their territory areas um, or within their territory areas just so that other visiting cats know that 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 bit's taken thanks very much um so you you can find that cats will go and toilet in other gardens but that's probably the reason behind it um or it might be that their own environment they don't feel very safe or secure so when they're toileting they um feel quite vulnerable they're you know they going back to back in the day before they were even domesticated they when you go into the toilet you're at risk um from being hunted by something so you they like to feel safe and secure where they're toileting and it might be something as simple as where they live that the person hasn't set up the right sort of toilet area within the house if they are hoping that they're going to use a litter tray so it could be located in a really busy environment with lots of through traffic of people and noise um or the you know another cat in the house is there that they don't particularly like or a dog or something like that that just means that they don't feel very safe and secure to go to the toilet there so they go and find somewhere that they do feel quite safe and secure and that might not necessarily be in their own garden it might be somewhere else within their territory so um there's there's reasons behind it i think is what i'm trying to say but in terms of deterring them um I mean, there are things, again, that you could try and do, um, especially from a gardening point of view, I guess. You could, they like uh, loose soil, so they like to dig, so they like to cover, they like, they're quite clean animals, so um, they do like to dig around in loose soil. So it could be that you make that soil slightly less inviting by, I don't know, plant, planting things that are a bit more prickly or placing pine cones around. Um, some people have sort of put sticks around on the um, on the soil so that it's not easy for them to get that scratching movement going um, which means they don't feel that comfortable about going to the toilet there um, or just actually covering the soil area with good um, ground cover plants you'll probably know a lot more about that than I do um, but I mean there's also the argument if it's a really ongoing issue that, that at the end of the day that cat is going to keep coming into your garden and it is going to use it for a toilet forever for whatever reason that sometimes we say to people maybe just embrace that and just make them a toilet area um or even if it's your own cat just make them an area that is inviting for them to use as a toilet so something that they can dig around in um you can even place um if there is some food in the garden you can actually put it in there so that their scent is there um so that you've just got one area that they start using as a toilet and therefore, the rest of your garden can stay relatively clean. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Um, yeah, exactly what you said about the planting. I have, I don't think, ever seen a cat use um, a properly planted area for a toilet. It would be very bare. Um, it, it's always in my 
experience kind of loose soil um, and uh, bare patches of soil or gravel. Um, so that gravel is just like one big inviting litter tray, really. Uh, so, yeah, it is about, I think, considering the spaces that you've got and what you put on them and... Yeah, but that's a genius idea, actually, about setting it up so that there is a designated area. I mean, that's just, you know, that's brilliant. Um, so I think, I think again, we kind of touched on it, really. If there are neighbourhood cats um, and they're choosing to use the garden as a battleground, that is a territorial issue. Um, you know, if you happen to, to be in the firing line of some warring factions, is there anything you can do to kind of encourage harmony um, well, cats are naturally solitary species, um, so they don't necessarily, and there's obviously exceptions to the rule, and there's lots of people out there that, you know, have got a pair of cats that are very well bonded, um, and they would be what we call like a social pairing, so there's lots of grooming each other, and aloe rubbing, which is, you know, entwining tails and rubbing their face against each other and stuff like that, but naturally they're a solitary species, and yes, if you have got cats that keep fighting in the garden, it's probably because they're trying to sort out a territory space. Um, but they do prefer to avoid conflict. They don't actually want to get into a fight because, um, you know, they know they're probably going to get hurt from it. They don't actively seek necessarily uh, conflict. Um, I know when I've had two cats squaring up to each other in my garden, um, maybe me just coming out just broke that, but it, they they lock eyes and sometimes they can't back down because they know that the minute they turn, the other one might chase. So they're kind of in this stalemate situation and they're just making an awful lot of noise <laughs> and, and not a lot else. So sometimes just you coming out to intervene um, or break that eye contact allows the two of them to just go their separate ways um, and um, and then they can go where they need to go so um but they they don't particularly like conflict if they can avoid it they will um but yeah in terms of encouraging harmony it's very difficult because the, the chances are that those two cats aren't actually going to live harmlessly together until they've worked out who owns what part <laughs> so they've just got to duke it out get on with it <laughs> so um obviously we kind of again touched on the issue of birds and cats um a lot of people take great pleasure in feeding birds in their garden. Um, what can we do if we want to put out feed for the birds, but but also try and keep them safe from the cats? We would certainly recommend feeding birds off the ground. Um, so using bird tables and things like that so that the, um, the birds have the advantage. Um, then the cat is obviously a lesser advantage of being able to stalk across the ground um, and catch them. You could, I guess, if you've got certain times of the day where you feed the birds, perhaps if it's your own cat that you're worried about, then to keep your cats in during those times of when you're feeding the birds. Um, but actually, I mean, there is an argument that feeding the birds attract other other animals uh, that people might not want to attract. And um, having a cat might actually keep things like mice or rats um, at bay as well. So... You might find that having a cat works to your advantage, especially if you you do want to feed birds because, you know, obviously they drop seeds and things like that and that can attract other things. So um, there could be advantage there as well. But certainly feeding them off the ground would be our biggest advice when feeding the birds. Mm. And how about, uh, does it make a difference if you kind of keep the feeders away from somewhere the cats can sneak, sneak up on them? So... I think sometimes, uh, obviously, if you've got a feeder and it's maybe near a fence and then the cat's got the opportunity to, to jump out, it, is that also advisable? Yeah, I mean, certainly in the open because then I guess the birds have a lot more ability to see around them as well. So, you know, don't if you're hanging things kind of low and in shrubbery, then it might allow the cat the advantage then to, to climb up and, and, like you say, sneak up on the birds. But um I mean, just from my own experience, that my cat was just rubbish <laughs> because as soon as she moved, the cat just still flew away anyway. Um, I mean, you can, there is um, obviously collars and bells and things like that. You can, you can put a bell on a collar, but the only thing is, is that we would recommend that the collars are only quick release collars. 
Um, it's something that we see all too often um, in our line of work is cats coming in with collar injuries where they've managed to get the collar caught under their armpit um, and then cause sort of big wounds um, underneath, which can be obviously very uncomfortable and, and painful. Um, so you do, if you are going to use a collar on your cat, just make sure it's a quick release one, which basically means if it gets nagged on something, it just literally pops apart. Um, but if you've got one of those, then you could also try a bell because, you know, then if they're moving quickly, it, it hopefully gives the, the birds a bit of warning. But cats are very good. They're quite good at, at stalking quietly. <laughs> um, and I did meet somebody who had a cat who learnt how to creep without the bell moving. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, don't try and outsmart a cat. <laughs> Get you every time. <laughs> Um, and also, actually, I was thinking as well, if we're feeding things like hedgehogs or foxes or, or whatever, particularly in an urban situation, um, I know a lot of people have those like night cameras and so they'll be watching it thinking that they're going to see uh, Mrs. Tiggy Winkles and then all of a sudden <laughs> next door's cat pops up eating all the food they've put out. I mean, is there anything you can do about that or is, is that just fair game? To be fair, the cat's not going to know that that bowl of cat food is <laughs> for the hedgehog, <laughs> not for them. No. So. Um, it's very hard to say that we could try and, and think of ways to deter that because it, you're basically putting a, a bowl of food out, um, which, you know, if a cat's walking by, it might think that looks quite nice. So, um, again, if it's your own cat, you could consider sort of keeping it in at night or something like that. But if it's cats that visit the area or visit your garden, um, then I guess it's, it's really something that you've got to be kind of prepared that might happen. Um, because it is, you know, especially with hedgehogs, it's a bowl of cat food, so it's got their name on it, so mm. <laughs> they've got rights to it. Mm. So, um, um, so yeah, it, it would be very difficult. Because I mean, you can get, I think, hedgehog houses and things like that that perhaps you can feed them in, and then the hedgehog can go into that, and the cat can't. So obviously, hedgehogs are a lot smaller than a cat, so you might be able to make something that a cat can go into. But you know, with boxes and things like that, I'm not sure that you would be able to to keep them away from each other when you're you're putting food out for them no but do bear in mind that not food, all food is going to be suitable as well so that's something to consider yeah that's true yeah they probably wouldn't be eaten well they might be eating leftover scraps but um yeah different different manufactured foods i guess um and also obviously we've spoken about the the bells on the collars and things um is it a good idea to try and keep your cat in at night or to try and keep them in a designated run you know do, it, do that, those kind of things work yeah certainly something we talk about is keeping your cat in at night for safety reasons um more accidents tend to happen at night road traffic accidents things like that more fights so um if your cat's happy to and it's always quite good to get your cat into a bit of a routine when you get it so that it comes in for the night gets fed and then um doesn't go back out until the following day um, that is certainly something that you can try, but not all cats are particularly happy about staying in all night and you sometimes get behavioural issues, stress and frustration because they prefer to be able to come and go as they please. Um, so that would be something an owner would have to consider about their cat and whether their cat would be happy to be kept in at night. Um, they, it's quite natural for them to, well, it's very natural. Um, for them to hunt and they become more active at sort of dawn and dusk time um so it could be that you keep them in just through those those periods of the day um but also if you are keeping them in there are things that you could do to mimic that hunting behavior because they they kind of need that hunt drive it's within them it's kind of their their nature it, it's built within them to need it and they get um they get a, an adrenaline rush from it you know they get a good feeling from it um, when they're doing that natural behaviour. So if you were to use certain toys with your cat, like set aside playtime for your cat, so like hunting toys, fishing rod toys, things that you can dangle and things that they can chase that you can kind of, um, you know, the sort of types that I mean that are on string and you can pull them along and the cat can kind of get closer and closer and closer and pounce. Um, and games like that are really good to play with your cat because it gives them that endorphin hit that they need. Um, and if you do that enough, then they might feel satisfied enough to not then want need to go out and hunt, if that makes sense. Mm. So um, lots of hunt drive play if hunting is an issue with your cat. 
lots of hunt drive play is a really good idea as something you could try to try and bring that hunt drive outside down does that mm. make sense yeah that's um, fascinating so yeah and and mimic it properly because they're not very successful with their hunting so they're not always going to catch that mice or that bird um but they'll get frustrated if they don't eventually so when you're playing with them you know don't let them catch it so that it it's not becoming a boring game so make it exciting make them have to work for it but now and again let them catch it um and get that feeling that they they succeeded but um yeah there's things that you can do i mean neutering your cat that does um reduce the need for them to want to wander um because if they're unneutered then obviously their whole reason for going out and about is often a different reason and they will go quite far and wide to to find that mate so neutering your cat is a really useful way of keeping your cat closer to home is there anything that we can do in our gardens to either facilitate them coming in and kind of enjoying the space or you know making it kind of not so welcoming is there anything in terms of plants or features in the garden um that that might be good to include or not include so there's certainly plants that cats really enjoy that will attract cats in so cat mint cat nip cat grass all things like that um cats will be attracted to um but equally there's plants that cats don't particularly like so strong smelling lavender um the smell of citrus they they don't like very much so if you wanted to deter them then perhaps lavender citrus things like that would be a good idea but if you did want to encourage them then yes cat mink cat grass things like that would do that but it's probably important to say that while we're talking about encouraging cats to our garden that cat does have a home and sometimes the more we encourage cats into our garden the more it might start hanging out in that garden and then someone might start thinking that their cat's gone missing um when actually it's just down the road so i think as long as people if you're attracting cats to your garden that's fine but just don't feed them if you can because um that will um potentially cause an issue for a cat moving across permanently to your garden um, from somebody else's and we do have those issues pop up now and again right so we don't want to be enticing neighborhood cats in well it might be that at the end of the day someone's cat might have a specific health condition or need a specific diet and we don't necessarily know that so we've got to be careful that we're not potentially causing issues for somebody else's pet yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so just to finish up, um, well, before we finish on the very last question, um, is there anything that you, you know, in summary that you might sort of say to people if they're really having issues with cats or, or if they're just one of those people that really can't stand cats, is there anything that you would say to them to kind of persuade them that maybe actually they're not as bad as they think? Well, there's lots of benefits to cats, I think, um, and it could be that they're doing somebody a great favour and they don't even know it, that they're keeping the rodent population down, but somebody doesn't necessarily know that there's an issue in that area. It might be because the cat's actually keeping it under control. So um, there are some benefits, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's somebody's pet, um, and cats make great pets and they're lovely and if you make friends with a cat you'll actually see its beautiful personality um and there's nothing more beautiful than looking out of your window and seeing a, a cat stretched out in the sun sun in itself on the patio um so i i think that there's a lot of benefits to cats um and you know i know that cats are not everyone's cup of tea and and we know that so it might be that you just gently discourage that cat from coming to the garden, but obviously we would ask everybody is to not cause harm to that cat. Good point. So um, is there anything that people can do to help cats protection at this time? Obviously you said you're, you've got a lot of cats, you know, looking for homes. Um, you know, is there anything anyone can do to support your work at the moment? So obviously, you know, the, the current situation that we're all in is a, a strange time for everybody and, it, and it's certainly thrown its issues um, towards the work that we do. But we are doing pantry homing because we do need to get our cats into homes. That's where they need to be. They don't want to be in our centres. They want to be in loving homes. So we are homing cats 
in a hands-free way, in a safe way. Um, so do visit our website. We um, have cats, like I say, all over the UK. We've got voluntary run branches. We've got adoption centres, all with cats looking for new homes. So visit the website, which is cats.org.uk, um, and you'll be able to find the nearest branch or centre to you. Um, otherwise, just support the charity in any way you can. We're fundraising as much as we can. Obviously, all our events were cancelled last year and who knows about this year. So we're doing lots of online events um, and ways to try and keep our donations coming in um, because that's how we're going to survive. So to continue the work that we do, um, we do need the generosity of the public as well. Thank you very much to Danielle for the information and advice. If you're a cat lover and would like to support cats protection, you can find links in the show notes plus more information from the charity about living with cats in your garden. And if you're not a cat lover, at least don't be a cat hater. They're not responsible for the loss of our wild bird populations. We are, us humans. So we need to take some responsibility and don't look to create scapegoats or scape cats. Thank you as well to Natural Grower, who sponsored this episode. They produce vegan and organic fertiliser and soil conditioner. And I can't recommend the soil conditioner enough. I used it for tomatoes last year and the plants stayed really green and healthy all year and the tomatoes were plentiful. Plus, I even found they needed watering less. It really is good stuff. And if you go to naturalgrower.co.uk and enter Roots15, all uppercase, on the checkout, you'll get a 15% discount. Thanks to you for listening. Here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about a bug that won't be welcome at this time of year. There's different reasons why daffodils and their related species might come up blind in the spring, which means that they produce their leaves but not their flower buds. Often it's down to the environmental and climatical conditions or even the age of the bulb, but it could also be an indication that the bulb is diseased or that it's under attack from a pest. Although daffodils don't have many plant pests, there is one that can be a serious problem often damaging and destroying many bulbs where it's become established. And this is the large Narcissus bulb fly, a hoverfly that first appeared in the UK about 120 years ago and has now become widespread. This bulb fly is about 1.5 centimetres in length and looks very much like a small hairy bumblebee, but with only one pair of wings. Varying in colour, from yellow to dark brown, they emerge on sunny days during mid-May to mate. The females then seek out the senescing daffodil leaves and lay their eggs on the neck of the bulbs. These hatch into little maggots that crawl down to the bottom of the bulb, entering it through the basal plate. Once inside, the maggots start to devour the fleshy centre, which includes the following year's flower buds. By the following spring, the maggots are fully grown, plump and creamy white in colour, and they'll leave the bulbs to pupate within the surrounding soil. Affected bulbs that were not killed by the infestation will likely survive to produce a few thin leaves before they then start to rot. Since there are no chemical options for controlling the large Narcissus bulb fly, cultural methods will need to be used. These can include growing daffodils in exposed locations rather than the sheltered conditions that the bulb fly prefers. And also, removing and disposing of any weak plants in early spring that could be displaying signs of a bulb fly infestation. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.